here. Uh, so uh, my talk today, I want to tell a story um, around a theorem. So let me start with the theorem. Um, the theorem, it's by Asaoka and Irie. So what does the theorem say? The theorem says for a C infinity generic Area preserving diffeomorphism of S two preserving uh, uh, the area preserving diffeomorphism of S two, the union of periodic points. is dense. All right. So while I know that this is a general statement, so I want to make sure everyone understands the spirit of the theorem, and I want to give some uh, context behind it as well. So of course, a periodic point of a map, I just want to imagine I have some point, and I iterate the map many times, and eventually I come back to where I started. And so what you can imagine is imagine taking an irrational rotation of S2. This is going to have only two periodic points, and they're both going to be fixed points. So in particular, it's certainly not going to be the case that the union of periodic points is dense. Um, however, what the oswaka irie theorem tells you is that I can perturb that map just a little bit, even in C infinity, uh, and I can get to some map where there's a dense um, set of periodic points. Uh, so are there any questions about the statement of the theorem? And so just to give some historical background, there's been some, um, there's been some pretty wide interest in this um, kind of question. Things like this are called closing lemmas. Um, and well, uh, the, the, the first such lemma uh, it, it, it are due to Pew um, from the 1960s. But in the, in the C1 topology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I mean by generic? Exactly, exactly. Bare category. That's right. Um, so I want to just say something about the topology here because this is part of the rub of what's interesting okay, about the Asuaka. Well. Right. So this is from about the 1960s. This is, uh, I think, from about 2015. So it's it's rather recent. Okay. Um, and uh, this passing from the C1 topology to you know, C infinity, I mean, from this it's easy to show that you have a density result for CR for all R. Um, that's a problem of significant interest. So, for example, uh, um, the generic structure of dynamical systems has been much popularized by the work of Smale. Um, the, the idea here is something like, you know, if you have a just an arbitrary dynamical system, its dynamics might be quite complicated, but possibly for a generic dynamical system, there's much more that can be said. So um, Smale states a question like this is problem number 10 um, on his list of problems for the 21st century. So um, so what, what Smale's problem about is about proving statements like this. I mean, here I have S2, but I could look for statements for arbitrary manifolds and not necessarily preserving an area form. Uh, but, but at any rate, suffice it to say that th this is a question of significant interest in dynamics. And so the reason that I um, uh, picked it as the starting point of my story is one reason that I really like this result is that the techniques involved in the proof use a lot of symplectic topology. So um, I think it's a good uh, um, starting point to, to learn a bit about what symplectic geometers think of. Okay. So in particular, you know, this is a story, so it should have various chapters. Um, I want to move into the first chapter, which is about how to measure size in symplectic geometry. So to understand this statement, it turns out we want to think a bit about how to measure size in symplectic geometry. Um, any other questions before I get? Uh, I Do you mention Michel Hammer at some point? Maybe, depending on the okay, time. So but I have a, a, a tightly packed talk. So. I mean, that's a nice story. So Michel Hammer uh, actually proved the result 
which says that, which essentially says that the question from C1 to C, C infinity is not a good question. It stopped the research and he, because of this and some other work he became a member of the French Academy. So it's a very interesting story. But, uh, right, if we have time at the end, we can tell more about the story. But, um, right, okay, so I want to get to, you know, how do we measure size in symplectic geometry? Well, first, let me remind you what a symplectic manifold is. So a symplectic manifold It's a pair um, of, well, I have an even dimensional smooth manifold. And this omega, it's a differential two form. Well, it's closed and it's non degenerate in the sense that if I take omega and I take its wedge product with itself n times, I get a volume form. Presumably, m most of you have seen these definitions before. If you have not, I won't motivate it too much, except to say that this is the correct setting um, for a, a geometric formulation of classical mechanics. Uh, what the symplectic form does is it gives the manifold the structure of a phase space in the setting of classical mechanics. Um, so what I'm very interested in, though, is how do we correctly measure the size of this manifold? So what, what kind of ways might we have to talk about how large this is? large is uh, well probably the simplest possible measurement that I could write down given the definitions that I've put on the board is the so-called volume of this symplectic manifold I can define the volume of m omega to just be well I have this beautiful volume form here so I can just integrate it over m and then I like to divide by so this is certainly some kind of reasonable measurement of size. Now, um, what do I mean when I call this a measurement of size? So for the purposes of this talk, the way that I know that I have a good measurement of size is that it should be monotone under symplectic embeddings. Um, if I have a symplectic embedding of one manifold into another, um, then that implies that the volume of my domain is no more than the volume of my target. And so here, just to give you some notation, what do I mean by a symplectic embedding? By the way, I want these to be manifolds of the same dimension. Um, what do I mean by a symplectic embedding? Well, here by, um, so this hook hour S means that there exists a smooth embedding that pulls back the symplectic form on the target to the symplectic form on the domain. Okay, so that's what I mean by, a, by an embedding. So this is some kind of size measurement. But uh, I claim that it's not always too um, informative. Okay, and I like to illustrate that with a beautiful example due to Macduff and Schlenk. So let's talk about an example, which should help you understand that symplectic geometry can be rather strange. Okay, so we want to understand how accurate is this measurement. Well, let's try to see how much it helps us understand embeddings of some pretty simple shapes. That's the sort of idea in the Macduff Schlenk picture. So what I can do is I can just take sort of one of the simplest shapes I could possibly think of, a four-dimensional symplectic ellipsoid. It's supposed to be the ellipsoid AB. This is defined, this is supposed to be just the number pi. It's a subset of C2, which I'm identifying with R4. Okay, there's a standard symplectic form on R4. I won't write it out unless there's interest in that. But so it gets some kind, of, it gets a symplectic form just by inheriting the sim standard symplectic form on R4. And then, well, I can look at a ball, which is just an ellipsoid, where the two parameters are the same. Okay, and so then I can ask, 
well, when, does, when can I put an ellipsoid into a ball? And how much does volume tell me about this question? So to make this precise, I can just define a function which encodes the answer. So I can define the function c of a, which is equal to the minimum over lambda, such that I have an embedding of my ellipsoid into a four ball of size lambda. OK. Um, so if I can compute this function, then by scaling and symmetry, I know exactly when I can put an ellipsoid into a ball. So in a minute, I'll tell you what this function is. And well, if you haven't seen it before, the, the point is that you probably won't be able to guess um, how complicated this function is. Okay, so, so what is this function? Well, remember, we're interested in how much does this function differ from what I would expect from volume considerations. So let's say what volume considerations are. So volume implies that this function is at least the square root of a. Okay? Because you know, if I compute the volume of this ellipsoid, it's just a. If I compute the volume of this four ball, it's lambda squared. And so if I'm going to have an embedding, lambda better be at least the size of root a. All right. So I'll draw root a on the board here. Here's sort of root a. And it turns out that I just need to know what the function is for a at least 1, because I can always assume that a is the larger parameter. So what does the function do? Well, at 1, it just is 1. And it starts just via a line that if I were to continue it, it would go through the origin. So it just goes linearly here. And then at 2, it suddenly changes its mind, and it veers directly to the right. Um, and it just continues horizontally until it hits the volume curve at 4. OK, so I'll tell you a little bit more about what the function does. But first, let me make sure that you understand geometrically what this is saying. OK, let's think about what the result at 2 is saying. So at 2, what the result is saying is that if I have an ellipsoid and it's stretched by a factor of 2, then the smallest ball that I can possibly put it in is a ball of size 2. OK, so this is some 4 ball of size 2. And I can't do any better. In other words, it's sort of obvious that I can put an ellipsoid stretched by a factor of 2 into a 2 ball. The content of the theorem is that I actually can't do any better than that. In other words, volume is certainly not seeing this, um, this sort of point. Uh, and I can call this an example of what's called symplectic rigidity. On the other hand, if I look at what this statement is saying at 4, well, I have an ellipsoid E1, 4. statement is saying that it fully fills a ball of size 2. So I could call this symplectic flexibility. That's a great question. Um, uh, let me postpone answering that for uh, a moment. The, the, um, the short answer is um, no. Uh, and then the sort of, uh, no, but the medium length answer is actually sort of kind of, at least up to an error of epsilon. Um, uh, right. Uh, well. Up to, so so let, let me tell it a little bit in a story. So this is some result due to McDuff and Schlenk. And in McDuff and Schlenk's result, um, uh, it's totally unexplicit what this map is. The result is sort of very um, complicated. It uses equivalence of Gromov and cyber gwitten invariants to sort of a lot of stuff. So certainly, if you were to just read their paper, you have sort of no idea what this map is in any explicit way. Um, however, it was later pointed out by Roger Casals that some of these maps you can construct um, at least up to an error of epsilon using almost toric vibrations. So there's some kind of, I don't want to go into the details of what an almost toric vibration is, but there is some kind of way to see this from the point of view of toric geometry, at least up to an error of epsilon. I, if you're happy putting this into a ball of size 2 plus epsilon, it's really a smooth map, indeed. It is really a smooth map. Yeah. 
So anyways, let me keep telling you a bit about um, what goes on here. I'll sort of block my previous board, but I think you sort of saw the point. Well, so now what does it do? Well, it, it always has to stay above the green line. So it actually just repeats the same idea. It goes by a line, then if I were to extend it, it would go through the origin. And then it changes its mind and it veers to the right. And it does it again and again and again and again. And it does it infinitely many times until it accumulates at um, the golden mean to the fourth power. OK, so where this tau is um, 1 plus root 5 over 2, the so-called golden mean, which, by the way, is about 6.8. Now, what else does it do? Well, the next interesting thing really happens at 17 over 6 squared. Okay. As I'm sure you all knew, just sitting here, it had to be 17 over 6 squared. So what happens at 17 over 6 squared? Well, there, the function just actually is equal to root a. So after 17 over 6 squared, um, volume actually does see the whole story. So from the point of view of this particular embedding problem, if the ellipsoid is sufficiently stretched, um, then, uh, then you know, actually this volume measurement is quite good. But it's really missing something o o over here when the ellipsoid is closed around. Now, what does it do in between these things? Well, it's some kind of mix of these behaviors. It has a, a step, and then it's the volume for a while, another step. The steps are getting smaller. I'm sure it's clear to all of you that there must be exactly nine of these steps. There's nine little steps like this. Okay. And a final point is, what are these numbers? I mean, this is 2. This is 4. The next one's 5. This one's 25 over 4. Well, um, these are determined by the odd index Fibonacci numbers. So um, the, the, the uh, points on the curve, the coordinates here, these are all determined by the odd index Fibonacci numbers. I mean, that's maybe slightly less surprising since we're seeing the golden mean, but it's a little strange that it's the odd index ones. Meaning, if I just list the Fibonacci numbers and I take the ones at odd places, um, then that determines the breakpoints here. So as a result, this behavior is called a so -called Fibonacci stereotype. And getting back to the question that was asked earlier, certainly uh, these embeddings over here where I'm fully filling the target are quite non-explicit. I mean, for, for something like the E14, for the Fibonacci staircase, there's some interesting things you can do with toric geometry. But eventually, you have to use this inflation method, which is quite non-explicit. But, but it does give a smooth map, indeed. Okay. So um, I'll see if you have any questions in a moment. But remember, my point of, I, certainly I didn't tell you how the theorem is proved. Um, this is just, you should consider this some data, which I'm giving you, to try to convince you that it seems like it might be sort of a hard question to measure size and symplectic geometry um, in a reasonable way. Certainly, my volume measurement is not enough to see this. OK. So are there any more questions before I move on to the next chapter of the story? So next, I want to tell you about a particular family of measurements that are called um, ECH capacities. So first, I want to tell you what a capacity is. I mean, these size measurements in symplectic geometry are precisely what we call symplectic capacities. So size measurements. in symplectic geometry come from what are called symplectic capacities. OK. Um, so from this point onward in the talk, I'm now going to restrict just to dimensions 4, 3, and 2. There's nothing really um, special about dimension 4, at least for the next thing that I'm going to say. Um, later, there will be some special things, which I point out. But I'm just doing this to simplify the notation. Of course, um, um, th these manifolds that we were studying are certainly four manifolds. 
these ellipsoids, these balls. Okay. Um, I'll make it clear where what I'm doing is special to dimension four and where what I'm doing is not. So what is a symplectic capacity? Well, there are various axioms that one might want to demand, depending on your preferences. Um, I'm going to pick out the ones that I want. So the first point is you should really be size measurement. So I take a four manifold, and I get some number. And I do want to allow myself to, to get infinity when I do this as well. OK, the key property is this monotonicity axiom. If I have an embedding of one four manifold into another, then it had better be the case that the size of the first is no more than the size of the second. OK. Um, and then the third axiom, like I said, there's some sort of different conventions depending on who you are. But the idea of the third axiom is I want to di make these symplectic capacities different from volume somehow. I want to make sure that I'm not just getting the volume. Certainly the volume satisfies you know, everything that I've written so far. Um, so So one way to do that is to demand that the capacity of an ellipsoid E1 infinity is actually finite, Okay, to distinguish it from the volume. I mean, there's a whole story about why this is a reasonable thing to consider um, coming from Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. I don't want to get too far afield from my talk. If there's time at the end, maybe can say more about it, but suffice it to say for now that I just want something to show that what I'm getting is not actually uh, the volume. And the volume of this would certainly be infinite. Of course, this is an infinite cylinder. You can think of this as a disk, you know, um, with the product of a disk in R2. OK, so anyway, so these are what symplectic capacities are. Um, and the heroes of today's talk are these ECH capacities. So today's heroes are a sequence. So so I want a sequence of symplectic capacities they could potentially be infinite um, called ECH capacities OK, well, hopefully soon I'll convince you that they are indeed heroic, at least from the point of view of this talk. Um, just to say, you know, this definition of symplectic capacity certainly makes sense in you know, n dimen two n dimensions. But these ECH capacities are definitely special to dimension four. I mean, their definition involves cyborg witten theory, et cetera. At least at the moment, they seem rather special. It's, it's an interesting question whether there are analogs. Um, reasonable analogs in higher dimensions. OK, so why are they so great? Um, well, let me tell you some properties. Yeah, right. It would be reasonable to require some kind of homogeneity. So the ECH capacities, they have the property that if I scale my symplectic form, then the scalar just pops out. Yeah, it scales linearly with the symplectic form. Um, that's right. But these are sort of the, the main axioms that I wanted to, to focus on today. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question, though. Um, so what kind of properties do they have that should make you like them? Well, first of all, they're accurate enough to see this entire McDuff-Schlenk um, infinite staircase. So McDuff has shown that if I want to know whether or not one ellipsoid embeds into any other ellipsoid, um, then it suffices to check whether ECH gives an obstruction. OK. Um, 
So I mean, earlier I presented this ellipsoid into ball thing as some kind of test for the accuracy of our measurements. Um, the, the, you know, this says that the ECH capacities pass the test. Of course, I'm the one who designed the talk, so maybe it should be less impressive because I, you know, rigged the test to be something that ECH could pass. But but nevertheless, um, certainly we don't have analogous capacities in higher dimensions. This is some special thing um, for dimension four. Okay. Yes. The next property, um, which I'm quite fond of because I was one of the people who proved it, um, and also because we need it to do this closing lemma business, um, involves a somewhat sort of funny question. I mean, I have these really fancy capacities. Soon you'll see that they're defined using floor homology, all this kind of thing. It would be a bit embarrassing if they couldn't even see this volume measurement. Um, uh, and, and indeed, that's what I showed, that, that, that they can see this volume measurement. So what I showed is that if you take the kth capacity and square it and divide by k, um, then you get the volume. Well, you actually get 4 times the volume. Um, Now, you need some kind of assumptions such that this is actually true. Uh, these ECH capacities, they are defined for any symplectic four manifold. This is not in general true for every symplectic four manifold, but it is true for um, what are called, for example, star shaped domains. And it's actually true in more generality than that, um, but if you want a sort of reasonable feel for it, uh, this star shaped domain is a good. Um, is a good uh, right exactly so I'm about to tell you it, what I mean so I just mean say some open connected subset of R4 um, that is bounded okay so, so that also inherits a symplectic form by restricting the symplectic form on R4 so certainly ellipsoids are such domains but I don't need a toric symmetry etc and, and and indeed this holds in um, higher generality in particular uh, eventually, we're going to move to contact three manifolds for which there's some kind of unconditional um, theorem like this. Uh, so this is really just sort of part of the story for now, that you can use these ECH capacities to recover the volume. And that's useful for this closing lemma. And of course, it, as I said, it's a bit embarrassing if you can't recover the volume from your fancy capacities. But we don't have a reasonable way to do this in, in dimension higher than four. Um, we have no idea what to do. Yeah, we have no idea what to do. Yes, that was going to be the next thing I was going to say. I was going to give you an example. So in fact, they're very computable for ellipsoids, say. Um, for ellipsoids, they're pretty fun because I can say what they are, and then you can see if you can get the Fibonacci staircase. It's, it's so let me give you some examples. Yeah, that's a great question. That's also something that I'm interested in. Um, it depends a bit what you mean by nice. Uh, so for toric, sort of for toric manifolds, I know a lot about how to compute them. I mean, I, I could probably compute it for any sort of what I call a toric domain. I mean, this ellipsoid has a torus action, but there are more general kind of things you can do. Um, so, so for a toric domain, I wrote some papers where you can compute them under some assumptions, but I mean, if you offered me like a free house if I could compute it for your favorite toric domain, I think presumably I could do it. Um, but but for some um, for some general symplectic four manifold, uh, it, it's sort of rather hopeless. So it depends a bit what you mean by nice. Maybe I should talk to the trustee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should imagine that they're pretty computable if you have some kind of symmetry like a toric symmetry or. Maybe even sort of an S1. But, but for a general thing, they're rather hard to compute. Yeah, let me, so is C1 essentially, I think, uh, the R1 has a computer program, and Bashi has a computer program to compute C1. Uh, what would you need C1? Right. If, at least if it's convex or something. Yeah, it's convex. Yeah. Under convex, it gives us. Right. What does it tell you? Well, I didn't want to get too far afield. But for example, um, uh, I could look at, I could look at a, I could fix I mean, since people seem rather interested in this, I could fix a open subset of the first quadrant. Um, so I could look at you know, an open subset of the first quadrant. Uh, and then I could look at the I could look at the manifold x omega, 
which is just the set of z1, z2, such that um, pi times the norm of z1 squared, pi times the norm of z2 squared, um, lies in this in this subset. Um, uh, so you know, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have some kind of torus symmetry. So, um, for example, from this point of view, if I take omega equal to just a triangle, if this is a triangle, if this is my omega, it's some region in the first quadrant of R2, then x omega is my ellipsoid, EAB. And I'm saying that if you draw me sort of any reasonable region like this, um, and, and my life depended on it, I could probably compute the ECH capacities of this. Yeah, you mean, you know, so, something like this or something, or, 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 or well, yeah. Well, there are very various things you could, yeah. I mean, as long as you have some sort of toric symmetry, you have some kind of chance. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe actually I'll skip over telling you what the ECH capacities actually are for ellipsoids, um, because I want to make sure I have time to get to everything. Um, but you can ask me during the questions and answers if you really want to know. But suffice it to know that, say, that for ellipsoids, for example, they have a very simple formula. So, yeah. For more complicated shapes, I mean, what I really have in mind is that in principle you could do some kind of like amoeba kind of thing like this or something. Uh, and they're more complicated, but still sort of, I think I could presumably do this. OK. So in the third chapter of the story, I want to tell you a bit about um, how these are defined. So, um, and I'll say right off the bat that one of the reasons I'm very attracted to this subject is that they have a very interesting connection with dynamics. I mean, that was already sort of alluded to by, by starting with the asuaka irie theorem. But at this point, there's sort of no dynamical systems in the picture. Um, but it turns out that they have an interesting connection with dynamics. So to make that um, precise, it's helpful to introduce uh, another kind of geometry, which is contact geometry. So again, there's versions of contact geometry in all odd dimensions. So I'm just going to stick to dimension 3. So a contact manifold is a 3-manifold It's a 3-manifold equipped with this one form. So what I require is I require the one form, um, its wedge product with d of it to be a volume form. And well, if I have a contact manifold like this, I mean, like I said, I want to connect to dynamics. The great thing is that I have a canonical vector field called the Rabe vector field. So lambda determines a canonical vector field, the so-called Rabe vector field. By, well, the point is, since this is a volume form, d lambda has a one-dimensional kernel. So I can take a generator for the kernel of d lambda, and then I can just normalize it to have lambda length equal to 1. So I get this beautiful vector field called the Rabe vector field. And um, the point is that these symplectic capacities will come from thinking about periods of closed orbits of this vector field. So the closed orbits, they're much studied. They have a name. They're called Rabe orbits. And well, um, the ECH capacities will come from, well, I'm going to leave a um, blank here in a second. So they'll come from periods of Rabe orbits. 
And the reason I left a blank is that they actually come from sums of periods of Rabe orbits. I mean, so this chapter of the talk, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of technical stuff in terms of floor homology, et cetera. So I'm going to take a very impressionistic sketch. Um, but there are some kind of points that I want you to get so that you get the feel of it. So that's, for example, why I put sums of periods in parentheses. It's not so important that they're sums. But what is very important is that you think about what it is that we're trying to do. Um, we have some kind of vector field. It could have uncountably infinitely many closed orbits. But I want to pick some kind of sequence of particularly significant orbits um, so that I can look at their periods and use those to get some plectic capacities. Okay? Um, so imagine that there's lots and lots of orbits here, and I want to pick some particularly nice ones. And I have to use floor homology to do the choice. Now, one thing that I want to say to orient you is where are these contact manifolds for these ellipsoids, for example? Well, actually, that's very easy. The nice thing is that all of these toric domains, they're four manifolds with boundary. So the contact manifold is taking place on the boundary. Here, the contact manifold would be like the boundary of an ellipsoid. So our sort of classic example here is the boundary of this ellipsoid, EAB. So I find these capacities for ellipsoids by looking at their boundary. Similarly, if I have a star-shaped domain in R4, I find the capacities by looking at the boundary. But I need to use some machinery to actually select the right closed orbits so that I actually get this monotonicity axiom in particular is quite um, right. Yeah. So there's a standard primitive um, for the symplectic form. You know, I can just take x1 dy1 minus y1 dx1 plus blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I just restrict it to the boundary, and then that restricts to the contact form. Yeah, so I just restrict the standard primitive of the one form. OK. So any more questions while I'm stopped, by the way? OK. So now I think I can erase this Fibonacci staircase. So how do I select the right orbits? The point is that I use floor homology to select the right orbits. So the sort of key idea is to use floor homology to select the orbits whose periods that I want to whose periods I want to look at. So as I said, here I'm going to have to give quite an impressionistic sketch. So I'll now give an extremely impressionistic sketch of floor homology. So what do I mean by this? So some details. Okay. So this embedded contact homology, this is going to be some type of floor homology. So the embedded contact homology, it's the homology of a chain complex. I'm going to write the chain complex CCH. So the ECH is the homology of ECC, okay, this embedded contact homology chain complex. Now, what's this um, chain complex? Well, uh, now that I told you that we want to select periods of orbits, you can kind of imagine what the chain complex might be. So what I want to do is I actually just want to take the chain complex generated by something like all possible closed orbits. So I guess I should write the differential here. So ECC is generated, say, over Z2. You could define it over Z, but for the application uh, to the closing lemma, you don't need that. So it's just generated over Z2 by, um, well, remember I said that the capacities are going to be period sums of periods. So it's actually generated by finite sets of Rabe orbits. OK, I left a blank here because I actually don't want all finite sets. I just want certain finite sets. OK. Um, uh, so by the way, I, I suppose I should say what this depends on. This is going to depend, at the end of the day, on um, my three manifold and my contact form. Okay. And then it's going to have a differential. Um, so just a technical point 
we want to assume lambda is non-degenerate. Um, but again, don't worry about that too much. I mean, if you're familiar with Morse theory, this is kind of like saying that I want to look at a Morse function instead of a, just an arbitrary function. I want to look at a non-degenerate contact form instead of an arbitrary one. So I take this massive Z2 vector space generated by finite sets of Rabe orbits with some conditions that will suppress. Um, and well, the game here is that I want something that is not going to depend on lambda. That's what floor homology does for us. I want something that's going to be independent of lambda. So that's where my differential is supposed to come in. So So the hope is that ECH should not depend on lambda. So in other words, what you could imagine is that I have a lot of different contact forms on a fixed three manifold. So I can imagine taking a family of contact forms and following its ray vector field around. Well, certainly when I do that, all kinds of bifurcations can happen to the closed orbits. You know, they can do all kinds of things. But I want to rig my differential so that no matter what happens, the homology stays the same. And that's where Gromov's theorem of pseudo-home theory of pseudo-homomorphic curves comes in. Um, so this delta, this delta, it's going to define. Uh, defined by counting, well, again, I left a space here, but I want to count pseudo-holomorphic curves. In R cross Y. Um, I want to think of R cross Y as a symplectic manifold. So I'll tell you what the symplectic form is. Um, well, I can just take the derivative of my contact form if I multiply it by e to the s. And while I want to count only certain pseudo-holomorphic curves, um, so I, I can show that delta squared equals 0 and that ECH is defined. And indeed, the great thing, the reason that I need to consider only certain finite orbits at certain curves is the amazing thing is I do get an invariant of y. I do get a three-manifold invariant. So it depends only on y. Um, and in fact, that's where the Seibert-Witten comes in. Because not only do I get a three-manifold invariant, I can try to relate it to some other three-manifold invariants. And I get three-manifold invariants coming from Seibert-Witten. So it actually agrees with the cyber witten invariance of this three-manifold. OK, so obviously I suppressed many details here. So I want to make sure I don't lose people. So like about 2,000 pages. <laughs> yeah, I suppressed about 2,000 pages of details. So are there any questions? I mean, th this is supposed to give the feel for it. Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, they go between ray orbits. The point is that they're supposed to go between ray orbits. So a sort of reasonable picture. So a sort of reasonable picture that you should have is something like this for the curves. Maybe I have some genus, but I have some, these are some ray orbits. These are some other ray orbits. So a, a reasonable way to think about them is what? Yes, exactly. So my domain here, it's a closed Riemann surface minus a finite number of punctures. And the point is that around each puncture, it's um, asymptotic to a ray orbit. And I have a partitioning of my punctures into positive punctures and negative punctures. So the positive punctures are tell you the ray orbits that are happening at plus infinity. This is my sort of r direction. This is my y direction. Um, and my negative punctures tell me what's happening at yeah, negative you infinity. You could imagine like here r3, the point at infinity is equivalent here. And you have a periodic orbit here, and you have a disk expanding. 
the other periodic order that you spend sort of projected in in third axis, which yeah. are bounded by this thing. And where, uh, from where comes hmm? the uh, J to define the Gaussian matrix? Comes the, the J? Yeah. yeah, that's also a great question. I mean, so, you know, Gromov's work, it involves how to define pseudo-holomorphic curves in symplectic manifolds. So I start with my contact manifold. I take its product with R. That has a canonical symplectic form. I can just take D of E to the S. Maybe it's better to call it a standard symplectic form. So then I can just take any almost complex structure um, that's compatible with this symplectic form in an appropriate sense. So I, yeah, it should be R invariant. Um, and it should do something reasonable with respect to the Rabe vector field. I mean, in particular, the key point is that it should take the Rabe vector field to D by DS, where, where if, this, if this has coordinate S. Right, so if this is d by ds, my almost complex structure should take the ray vector field to d by ds. That's sort of the key which powers this. Um, and, and then it turns out that the space of such things um, is contractible, and so I, I get invariants which don't depend on my choice of almost complex structure. So that's sort of some great observation of Gromov, that there is some kind of choice of almost complex structure, but nevertheless, um, yeah, the, the homology doesn't depend on this choice. OK, so I want to zoom ahead a little bit just because I want to get done before the talk is over. What was it that uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the guy who is the fields medalist at uh, Mathematical Conversations, he, he said that the clock stops when people ask questions. But I, I don't think that that's actually true. Smirnov said that the clock stops when people ask questions. So I, I don't think that that's true. So I, I want to uh, 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 try to finish in a reasonable amount of time. OK. So in particular, I've told you about this floor homology. Um, I want to at least give you some feel for where the capacities come from. And the point is that not only is this a complex, but it's actually a filtered complex. So ECC is filtered by, well, earlier I called it, um, earlier I called it the period of the orbit. But it's maybe better to think of that as the action. So it's filtered by, well, I can look at the action of an orbit gamma which is just the integral of my contact form um, over gamma for gamma closed orbit. Right, so what am I saying here? I'm saying a closed orbit has an action, so a sum of closed orbits have an action. So I can look at, I get some kind of filtered complex, ECC upper L, which is generated by orbit sets with action less than L. Yeah, yeah, and indeed. Right, I want to allow both orbits and their multiple covers, and it just multiplies linearly. So now the point is that, at least in the star-shaped case, which is where I stated my theorem, the ECH capacities are going to come from looking at where the rank of this filtered complex jumps. More the rank of its image um, in the full embedded contact homology jumps. So there's a map um, ECH upper L. I mean, so the point is that the differential respects this filtration. So I can look at the homology of the subcomplex. OK, and the capacities, so the capacities, say, in the star-shaped case, come from looking at where the rank of the image jumps. OK, so what you can imagine is, imagine this is some negative number. I mean, then this is just going to have rank 0. Now, the first interesting ha thing that happens is where L crosses 0. Because I actually do want to allow the empty set of Rabe orbits to be some perfectly legitimate um, um, set. So then the rank is going to jump. But now I sort of continue looking and looking, and then at some other point, the rank is going to jump. I mean, there's some kind of interesting point here, which is like, um, how do I know that this whole um, theory isn't just 0? Um, um, 
uh, like all of embedded contact homology. But, but su suffice it to say that actually, you know, eventually this thing, the full ECH always has infinite rank. So by some kind of magic, this always has infinite rank. So just look at where the rank jumps, and that gives you my ECH capacity, at least in the star-shaped case. Okay, so now you sort of know a bit about how these are defined. Um, I'll see if there's any questions. In the final part of the talk, I want to tell you in slightly less, but still rather impressionistic form, um, how the Erie Asawaka result is proved. Okay. It's just the, the rank will, at least um, generically, the rank will always jump by one. The, the rank of the image. I'm saying the, this is just some map of vector spaces over Z2. And I want to just increase L and then see you know, what, for what values of L will the image of this, you know, it, its dimension as a Z2 vector space, go, go up. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. You have to say something maybe about the structure. Actually, it's like what CPN, the CP infinity. That's what I. Yeah, it has infinite rank. Right, right. I mean, it could be the cohomology of CP infinity, something like this, as a generation over this one period in the second generation. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so. But so maybe it was complete. There is actually also a degree two of. Well, I could have done it in terms of the degree, but I claim that what I wrote is a sort of um, a perfectly well-defined process. But so, I, I, so I think, for example, if, if ECH would be generated, there would be a generator of degree two and can take products. You could look how high it can go in the number of products. So something like this in the back. So it seems to me that the old company could of say that we are a national damage in some of the numbers. Well, ma maybe I just want to. Um, finish the proof, uh, and then uh, we can leave discussions for questions and answers. I mean, um, OK, so, so, um, so, OK. So now I want to give, in the remaining few minutes, a very impressionistic sketch of how the Asawaka Irie um, proof goes. Because there's at least um, three ideas that I want you to take from this sketch. The closing lemma. All right. So what's the point? Sort of idea number one um, is that I start with this map phi going from S2 to itself that I want to perturb. And I look at y sub phi, the mapping torus. So just to be explicit, I want to write y sub phi say as you know s two cross um, zero one modulo some equivalence relation, uh, and I give this zero one coordinate t say. All right. So there's a ray vector field here. There's a vector field here, um, which I'd like to at least pretend is a ray vector. Field. So the dynamics of the vector field, partial t, recover the dynamics of my map b. b. OK, so that was point one that I wanted you to understand. Uh, we started in the world of surfaces. We went to four manifolds. I said that the symplectic capacities really come at the boundary, which is a three manifold. And now we want a three manifold to appear again. We just take the mapping torus of this map. OK, so that's sort of point one. So now we're going to lie um, to, to give our sketch. But it's a lie that has a lot of truth. So our first lie is um, we want to pretend that this is actually a ray vector field. Um, and 
In the very end, I'll tell you how to sort of repair the lies. And let's actually say what its, con what its contact form is. So let's just call it lambda. OK. So um, well, now, if you think about what this closing lemma comes down to, uh, we want to, so what we'll do is we'll perturb lambda and use the volume identity. OK, so what does this closing lemma come down to? So what it comes down to, well, I pick some point p um, in y, and I take some small open set u around p. OK, so what I want to do is I want to convince myself that if I perturb lambda a little bit, then I can guarantee that there's a closed orbit passing through u. Then I can use the bare category theorem, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to perturb to get closed orbit through u. So now the funny thing is we're almost done, actually. So I just perturb in the most obvious way. I take a bump function. And I replace lambda, a bump function in u, and I replace, let's call this um, f, and I replace lambda with, um, well, e to the f times lambda, um, just because I want. Um, so I, yeah, so I take some positive, you know, some non-negative bump function. Okay. And so the point is that after this perturbation, the volume goes up. So you put a little dimple on the boundary of the... That's right. Right. So the volume goes up. So as I said, this is some impressionistic sketch. Um, I want to explain the key idea, and then if you have questions, I'll um, take questions in the, in, the, um, in the question and answer. So the volume goes up. Um, so what would happen if there were no Rabe orbits that appeared in this process? Well, if there were no Rabe orbits, then each of the ECH capacities would stay exactly the same. So if no Rabe orbits through u, each CK would stay the same. So that's, which is, contradicts the volume identity. And that's the proof. Um, so I'll write the volume was that this CK squared over K converges to the volume. Right. Right. So, um, um, so just to say what the lie was, and also just to give you some idea of the amount of pages involved. I mean, so you would think from this that the Asawaka Irie paper is one paragraph. Well, it's actually five pages. So that should give you some idea of the level of lying that goes on. The, of course, the big lie is that this is not, in general, the ray vector field for a contact form. Um, you can do some kind of conformal rescaling to get it to look like the ray vector field for a contact form, and that's essentially what they do. That's why it's five pages instead of one. Um, but sort of the key uh, that you wouldn't get yet is why S2? Why can't I do this for just an arbitrary surface with you know, whatever genus I want? Um, and the, the point is that every map, uh, every area preserving map of S2 is Hamiltonian. 
And that really helps with this kind of rescaling that they want to do. Um, and indeed, they actually prove a similar thing for any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of a closed surface. Um, but, and one of the questions that I'm interested in thinking about while I'm at the Institute is um, whether or not this can be done for arbitrary uh, area preserving map of surfaces. Because it, uh, apparently that was some question that Juan Correa asked uh, a while ago. So, okay. so I think I'll stop there. Right.